Thank you very much, uh, fellow Kenyans. I'm Comrade Babu Owino, member of Parliament and Bakasi East constituency, and your teacher. Today's uh, subject uh, is uh, on biology, and biology will be handling genetics by Mr. Richard Nesta, an intellectual, a comrade, whose intellectual capacity is at optimum. I hope you shall enjoy, and you shall be uh, uh, drinking from the nipples of his wisdom. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Karibu Mwalimu. Thank you so much, Mashimia. Sawa, sawa, sana. Okay, hello students. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable, for inviting me again to use this great platform to talk to our students. I'm glad to be here again today. Students, today I'm going to talk about um, genetics. So welcome and uh, stay with me through this biology session and uh, our topic for today it's genetics this is going to be like part two the con continuation of uh, the initial part we did on facilitation of uh, uh, biology paper two where we are again going to share some time to look into the issues in uh, paper two particularly genetics some of the common issues why students usually fail uh, in questions of genetics and how best we can prepare ourselves to ensure that we maximize our chances of scoring highly in this topic. Just like titration is common to chemistry, it's the same, same way genetics is common to paper two. If you can trace from the time that the current format of biology exams was introduced in the year 2006 up to now, there's no any given time in which questions of genetics have missed in biology paper two. But surprisingly, even though this, question, uh, this is a very commonly occurring topic in biology paper two, students still usually find it very difficult to score maximum marks here. And that's why it's important for us to spend some time and navigate through genetics. We look at the issues, what are the common mistakes that students make here, and how best can we prepare. So welcome and uh, Enjoy the session we are going to have. Once again, I'm your teacher for today, Richard Nesta. So straight away, uh, I would like us to look at what are the common questions which students usually encounter in genetics and uh, what are the common mistakes that candidates usually make and how best can we prepare for genetics. So in most cases, Questions on genetics are always tested in section A of biology paper two, and these questions can always range from one, definitions of terms. The question can simply be maybe define what alleles are, define multiple allelism, define a back cross, de de define a test cross, define genetic engineering. The questions can also involve working out genetic crosses. The questions can also involve calculations of probabilities, calculations of genetic ratios, calculation of phenotypic ratios. The questions can also involve explaining various genetic concepts, like how is sex determined in man? How is sex determined in birds? How are blood groups inherited? The concept of erythroblastosis for Italis or the hemolytic disease of the newborn baby how does it come across? What are mutations? What are the advantages of mutations? What are the types of mutations? All these are very, very important aspects which are commonly examined and many times students usually struggle to get maximum marks from uh, these areas. So kindly stay with me as I navigate you through this area so that we learn, on these, we learn from these mistakes going forward. So, what are the common reasons why students usually fail in genetics? Students usually fail to score maximum marks in genetics because one, lack of precision in definitions. A question is asking students to define an allele and a student defines alleles. A question is asking a student to define homozygous condition and a student defines homozygote condition. A question is asking students to define test cross or, or distinguish back cross, and it becomes a challenge, a sign that there is a problem in seriously mastering the, concerns, uh, the concepts of uh, genetics. So it's important that before we go further, 
there's those are these are the, these are the problems which are related to construction of genetic crosses like fusion problems contradictory phenotypes and genotypes omission of a cross at the genotypes level in complete gametes we are going to come to that but before we discuss those issues it will be important that we try to review the basis of genetics that we try to review some of the common terms that we we have in genetics and um, we bring ourselves to a good understanding before we discuss the common mistakes in genetics. So I would like us to look at the terms that we have projected on your screen and we try to, dis to, 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 to recap our knowledge of these common terms that we always encounter in genetics. Uh, <coughs> last time in one of the sessions with uh, my colleague, Madam Josephine, you were taken through introduction to genetics and to define genetics as the study of inheritance and variations. And uh, by now, even recalling from your biology in Form 3, you must have learned that we have, when we talk about a chromosome, a chromosome is a thread-like structure that you find in the nucleus and contains hereditary information. A cell that is undividing, if this is the nucleus of the cell, and this cell is not dividing, usually chromosome occurs as a thread-like structure. And actually, it's a highly coiled thread-like structure, which we cannot see easily with our naked eyes. But the chromosomes usually become visible during cell division, because during cell division, the chromosomes usually condense, and they condense into a linear structure like uh, the one you will see on my far left. They usually condense into a linear structure. And this condensation is very important because it is the condensation that makes it possible for the chromosomes to segregate during mitosis and during meiosis. It will be very, very difficult for chromosomes to segregate and separate into different cells if the, cro the chromosomes were to remain in the highly intertwined thread state. So that is usually the significance of the chromosome um, condensing into linear structures after which it becomes easier for uh, the chromosomes to separate. And also by now you should be able to remember that different organisms have got different definite numbers of chromosomes. Like us in human beings, we usually have uh, 46 chromosomes but these 46 chromosomes are always arranged in, in pairs. So this is to mean that if I was to represent chromosomes in man, we will be having 23 pairs of chromosomes inside the nucleus of the cell. So this is like pair 1, pair 2, pair 3, pair 4. We will go up to pair 23. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but in total we are having 46 chromosomes in total. The chromosomes which form a given pair, in most cases they are of the same characteristic length. And due to this, the members of a pair, a pair of chromosomes which are of the same characteristic length and shape, we always refer to them as homologous homologous chromosomes. So this is a homologous pair of chromosomes. This is another homologous pair of chromosomes. This is another homologous pair of chromosomes. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in human beings. In women, we are having 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. But in men, we only have 22 pairs of chromosomes which are homologous. The 23rd pair is not, we have 22 pairs of chromosomes which are homologous in men, but the 23rd pair is not always homologous because of this reason. Remember the 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 are what we call autosomal chromosomes. These ones are chromosomes which contain genes which control inheritance of body features, various body features. But then the 23rd pair of chromosomes, we always refer to them as the sex chromosomes. This is because these chromosomes are responsible for determination of sex of uh, an individual. 
So we are having 46 pairs, 46 chromosomes, but they are arranged in uh, pairs. Now, the term ploidy. Ploidy is a term that describes the number of sets of chromosomes which we find in a cell. I want us to imagine these three cells that I want to indicate here. And I'm going to represent only the nuclei, the nuclei of these cells. So assuming this is one chromosome, this is another chromosome. I'm going to use the different colors to represent different chromosomes. And this is another chromosome. So I am having three chromosomes in this nucleus. But then here, I am having, I'm going to have another representation here. Then here I have this. So in these representations, I want us to observe the differences that we have here. So we have three types of chromosomes in all these scenarios. We have three different types of chromosomes in all these scenarios. But basically you can see that in this case we are only having one type of chromosome of each kind. So this is a case where we will say we are having one set of chromosomes. But if you come to illustration number two, we are having three different types of chromosomes, but we are having two chromosomes of each kind. So we are having two sets of chromosomes. But in this case, we are having three sets of chromosomes. There are terms that we always use to describe this state. If chromosomes are such that we are having one set of chromosomes of each kind, this state is described as a haploid, a haploid state. So this cell is said to be haploid. Haploid to mean it has one set of chromosomes. If we have two, we describe this state as diploid. And if we have three, we describe this trait as triploid. If we have to have four, that will be uh, tetraploid. But anything from three going forward, three sets, four sets, that one is described as a polyploid, polyploid cell. So it's always important to take note of this. So ploidy is a term we always, if we are asked to define what ploidy is, ploidy is simply a term that describes the number of sets that we have in a chromosome. A haploid cell is a cell that contains one set of chromosomes. Diploid contains two sets of chromosomes and polyploid has got more than two sets of chromosomes. So remember, uh, the normal body cells, the normal body cells usually have um, diploid number of chromosomes. If you are to take any cell from our body, you take a cell from my hand, you take a cell from, the, a cell from my feet, a cell from my tongue, a cell from the epithelium or my ileum, all those cells, we always find they do have a diploid state of chromosomes, meaning the cells will be having two sets of chromosomes of each kind, of which for us human beings it will be 23 pairs of chromosomes. But if you come to the gametes, the gametes usually have one set of chromosomes. So the gametes usually have um, a haploid state of chromosomes. If we are to illustrate this, remember, we said we have 46 chromosomes in our body cells, but during meiosis, that is during formation of gametes, from, for the males, we always have the sperm cell, then we have the ovum cell. From the man, man has got 46 chromosomes in the cells. Woman has 46 chromosomes in the cell. But during formation of the gametes, this number of chromosomes is always halved during meiosis. So in the sperm cell, we'll only be having 23 chromosomes. In the human, in the, in the ovum also, we'll also be having 23 chromosomes. Now during fertilization, when the two fuse to give us the zygote, the diploid number of chromosomes is always restored back to 46 chromosomes. So meiosis usually halves the number of chromosomes in the gametes. 
So in, in gametes, the number of chromosomes is always deploy, uh, haploid, but in the somatic, the normal body cells, the number of chromosomes is always uh, deployed. So it's always important to take note of that. Then now, what do we mean by the term, what is a gene? What is a gene? Remember we said chromosomes contain hereditary information. And the chromosomes, we, by now we have said they occur in pairs in the normal body cells. So I'm going to represent a homo homologous pair of chromosomes. And remember chromosomes contain, chromosomes are chemical in nature, they contain DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And uh, if you recall from your lessons, you must have learned that the DNA is the primary genetic material. All through the chromosome is made up of highly coiled, highly coiled DNA. And uh, DNA is the part of the chromosome that controls the inheritance of a particular characteristic. So if um, we have homologous pair of chromosomes here, you will find maybe this particular point is a gene. Let me say that, for example, if we're talking about my, this is this section is containing the gene responsible, the, the gene that is controlling height. This other section here contains the gene that is controlling uh, body weight. So DNA is a section of the chromosome that controls the inheritance of a particular characteristic or the synthesis of a particular protein in our bodies. And the specific location of a gene, the specific location of a gene on a chromosome is what we always call gene locus. Locus. So gene locus refers to the, the physical location of a gene on a chromosome. So like this is uh, the location of the gene for height. This one is the location of the gene for body weight. So this is the gene locus for the gene of uh, controlling height. This is the gene locus for the gene that is controlling body weight. In plural, we talk of gene loci. So gene loci is simply the plural of, um, the plural of uh, uh, gene locus. And what is the relationship between an allele and a gene? I want us to remember this scenario. When we are looking at Mendel's experiments, when we are looking at Mendel's experiments, for height as a characteristic, Mendel was able to observe that some plants were tall while some plants were dwarfs. And Mendel, remember, was the first person who described the theory of uh, the, the, the basis of inheritance, as we know it well today, that inheritance of characteristics is controlled by a pair of factors of which only one can be present in a gamete. By that time, it was not even known to Mendel that what he was describing as factors yeah. were actually the genes. So this means there is a gene that is controlling height, and this gene, it has two forms. One form of the gene is responsible for tallness, and one form of the gene is responsible for dwarfness. And remember, when you cross the tall plant, tall pure breed plant, and the dwarf pure breed plant, you got plants which were tall in the uh, F1 offspring generation. This meant that the gene for tallness was dominant over the gene for dwarf. And by now, you must recall that we represent the dominant genes with a capital letter, and we represent the recessive genes with a small letter. So if I was to represent the homologous pair of chromosomes once again, something that will be worth noting also again, assuming these are chromosomes we find in garden pea plants that Mendel used, at this particular point, let's say that in the heterozygous plant, that is capital T, small t, let us imagine that at this particular point is where we are having the gene for plant height. And you can find at this particular point we are having capital T, and here we are having small t. So remember, when chromosomes are homologous, 
In the corresponding sections, they are having the gene that is controlling the same characteristic. However, the forms of those genes can be, can be different. The forms of those genes can be different. Like remember now we are having the two, the, the two genes for height, capital T, small t. They can occur in the following pairs. You can have capital T, capital T. You can have capital T, small t. You can have small t, small t. These are the possible pairings that you can have from the two alleles. So I want us to understand the difference between the difference between a gene and an allele. A gene refers to the section of a chromosome that controls the inheritance of a particular characteristic. So this particular section of these chromosomes is controlling height. But we know by now that height, a plant can be tall or it can be dwarf, meaning it has there's a, a gene that is responsible for the tallness in this plant, and there's a gene that is responsible for dwarfness. So this means we have two different forms. We have two different forms of the gene that is controlling height. And the different forms of a gene that, uh, that is controlling a particular characteristic are the ones we are calling alleles. So alleles simply refer to the alternative forms of a gene. Small t is an alternative form of the gene for height, which is responsible for dwarfness. Capital T is an alternative form of the gene for height, which is responsible for tallness. Assuming that we are having, assuming that the color of our eyes was being controlled by two, by, by genes, so that one can have blue eyes or one can have gray eyes. So that will mean there's a gene for blue color and there's a gene for the gray color. So th there's a gene that is controlling the color of the eye, but the one form of the gene is responsible for blue color. One form of the gene is responsible for the gray color. So this means that the gene, control, the gene responsible for gray and the gene responsible for blue color, these are, both of them are different forms of the gene that is controlling the color of the eye. So it's always important. Sometimes they are being used as if they mean the same thing. But take note that gene and alleles are very, very different things. And then still on this point also, we can describe the terms recessive and um, dominant, dominant gene. So for the case of tallness, if we have a scenario where at this particular point in the gene for, for, for height, if we have capital T, small t, if the, so these are the allelic pairs for, the, the, for, for tallness. If we have capital T, small t, this plant will be tall in appearance. If we have small t, small t, this plant will be dwarf. And if we have a capital T, capital T, this plant will be tall. So the terms I want us to describe here are homozygous and heterozygous. If we have, if for a given characteristic, the alleles are the same. If for a given characteristic, the alleles are the same in that pair, then we say that that organism is homozygous for that particular characteristic. So if a plant is small t, small t, it in, in terms of genotype, it means this plant is homozygous. This is also homozygous. But how do we distinguish between these two homozygous conditions? Small t, small t, in, this is homozygous recessive. Capital T, capital T is homozygous dominant. So what is a dominant gene? What is a recessive gene? Or what is a dominant allele and what is a recessive allele? If we look at this case, if the alleles are different, we describe the condition as heterozygous. And if a plant heterozygous, we realize that the plant ends up being tall and not dwarf. Why is this the case? This means that the gene for tallness, in a way, is dominant. It masks the gene for recessive. When the gene for tallness is present, the gene for dwarfness will not be able to express itself. It will not be uh, expressed in the phenotype of the, of the individual. So a gene that expresses itself in the homo heterozygous state is referred to as a dominant gene. But a gene that can only express itself in the phenotype, in the homozygous state only, we call that kind of a gene a recessive gene. And remember, 
the genetic constitution of an organism for a particular characteristic, we call this one the genotype. So like in this case, if someone wants to ask you, what is the genotype of this plant? The genotype is capital T, capital small t, meaning the kind of genes. Geno if you ask for genotype, genotype means what genes does the organism have for that particular characteristic. Though in um, higher classes, you also realize that the term genotype can also basically mean the entire composition of genes that an organism has. But in our case, we refer to genotype as the genetic constitution of an organism for a particular characteristic. Then the phenotype now refers to the outward appearance of an organism. How does the organism appear? Like inwardly, these organisms, if an organism has got, this, has got these cases which we have just described, this is tall. So tall is the phenotype, but the genotype is capital T, capital T. This plant is also tall. tall. So the tallness is a phenotype because it is something you can outwardly observe. But this plant is dwarf. Dwarfness is something that you can also outwardly observe in an individual. But now, what is the difference between homozygous and homozygote? Homozygous describes the condition. But now a homozygote now refers to an organism which is homozygous for a particular condition. For example, if a plant is having the genotype capital T, capital T. This plant will be referred to as a homozygote. Why are we saying it is homozygote? It is homozygote because it is having the same, the alleles are the same for tallness. The alleles are the same for tallness. So it's always important for us to be able to understand these terms and describe them accurately. Remember for questions of definitions, the exact, you have to be exact. If you give relatives of definitions, then you want to be able to score marks from there. I will explain the concept of the test cross and then we continue. So what do you mean by a test cross? By now you know that if an organism is of this genotype, this organism is tall. If an organism is of this genotype, this organism is tall. So if the organism is homozygous dominant or it is a, if it is heterozygous, phenotypically they'll appear tall. And they will be tall of the same stature because we will not expect this to be intermediate tall. It will just be as tall as this one. So it won't be easy for you to tell. Meaning if you come across, this basically means if you come across a garden pea plant which is tall, you cannot tell whether it is heterozygous or whether it is homozygous. So that, that, that test, the investigation that you will carry out to enable you know whether the tall plant that you have come across is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, that is what we are going to refer to as a test cross. And a test cross is usually basically, it is usually an investigation that occurs over a long period of time. Don't think it is just a crossing we just do on the board. So how, assuming I want to do an experiment, I have come across a garden pea plant, which is very tall. How will I carry out an investigation to know whether it is capital T, capital T, or whether it is heterozygous? So what I will need to do, I will need to look for a homozygous recessive individual for this trait, which is height. So I look for a dwarf plant. Then what I will do, I will allow this, I will let this dwarf plant to flower. I will let this plant flower, produce flowers. Then once it has produced flowers, what I will do, I will then take, when this matures, I cut off the stamens. After cutting off the stamens, I will come, then I dust the pollen grains on the stigma of this plant. And I also remember, I also have to cut off the stamens of this, of this uh, dwarf plant. Then I dust the stamens, so I'll be introducing the pollen grains from the tall plant, which I don't know its genotype. But remember this one, I know its genotype, because if a plant is dwarf, then basically that is uh, this genotype. So I am, what I'm going to do is going to be referred to as crossing. After crossing, I will cover these flowers, maybe with a polythene paper. 
The reason of covering is to ensure that pollen grains from another plant um, do not come in to fertilize the flowers here. Then I will let the, 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 the seeds form. Once the seeds form, then I will plant the seeds. After planting the seeds, I will then monitor. I will then monitor them as they grow. With the main observation is, I will be interested in knowing how many of the seeds will grow in drew, into dwarf plants and how many will grow into tall plants. So let us imagine a scenario where I have collected the seeds there, maybe after three months or after two months. And if I grow them, I find this scenario. I find a case where three plants are tall and three plants are dwarf. So it is three tall to one to three dwarf, which translates into a ratio of one tall to one dwarf plant. How is that ratio going to be important for me to me in my genetic cross? Uh, remember, our tall plant, we are suspecting that it is either homozygous dominant or it is heterozygous. So what am I going to do? I want us to imagine the scenarios. If we are to cross the plant, if the plant is capital T, capital T, then let us to try to imagine how the crossing would be. So parental phenotypes. This is tall and this is dwarf. So parental genotypes. This is cap assuming it is cap uh, homozygous dominant, we will cross this and this is dwarf. Then we come to the gametes. This is capital T. This is capital T. This is small t. This is small t. And if we were to do the fusion, then we will realize this. Uh, this we fuse this with this one. We get this. If we are to fuse this with this, capital T, small t. And if we fuse these ones also, we get capital T, small t. So this is the F1 generation genotypes. And what will be the F1 generation phenotypes? The F1 generation phenotypes, this one will be tall, this will be tall, this will be tall, this will be tall. So it means that if at all that tall plant was homozygous uh, dominant, then all the seeds we expect them to give us tall plants in the F1 generation. How about if the plant was, so if the tall plant was heterozygous, then it would imply that if you are doing the crossing, parental phenotypes, this is uh, tall and this is dwarf. Uh, sex, gender symbol, sex symbols there. And parental genotypes. Uh, this is, uh, so assuming it was heterozygous, this will be uh, this case. Then when we come to the gametes, this is capital T, this is small t, small t, small t. So if we do the fusion, this is what we will have. And if we do this fusion, this is what we have on this end. So this is F1 generation genotypes. And what is F1 generation phenotypes. This is tall, this is tall, this is dwarf, this is dwarf. So you realize that you are having two tall, two, two dwarf. And this gives you a ratio of one 
tall to one dwarf. So I am going to flip back and bring you back to our scenario. I told you that when, we had, when I was to do this experiment to determine the unknown genotype, I dusted the pollen grains on the stigma of this flower. I allowed the seeds to mature, then I planted them. And later on, I found that I was getting uh, tall, pl when I planted them, I was getting tall plants and dwarf plants in the ratio of one tall to one dwarf. So compare these results to these scenarios. When do you get this result of one tall to one dwarf? If at all the plant was homozygous tall, then we cannot get uh, the tall and dwarf plants in the ratio of one to one. All the plants, the resulting plants will have been tall. But if at all that tall plants was homozygous, like in this case, then now we are realizing our tall and dwarf plants will be in the ratio of one tall to one dwarf. So this investigation will, th I will therefore conclude from those results that this tall plant that I came across, it is heterozygous. So the cross that you carry out to enable you to determine which of, to determine the genotype of an unknown individual, by, to determine an unknown genotype, by crossing that individual with a homozygous recessive individual for that trait, that is what we are referring to as a test cross. It's always very, very important to take note of that. And still on the same note, it is important that I take you through this. The genetic cross is a commonly examinable area. And interestingly, students usually lose lots of marks here. And I want us to look at these scenarios that I have represented. If you are to represent, a gen to work out a genetic cross, what does the examiner look out for? The first mark is usually earned at the parental genotypes. And you will only earn this mark if you have used the appropriate letters and you have represented a cross to indicate fusion that, that uh, uh, meeting has taken place between the organisms. And at the same time, the, letter, the, the genotype must not be contradicted by the phenotypes that you have indicated if you choose to represent the phenotypes. Then the second mark is always earned at, so the first mark is earned here, the second mark is always earned at the gametes. And you will only get the mark at the gamete if one, the gametes are fully cycled and they are well represented. They're fully cycled, no discontinuities. What you mean by this is uh, this scenario. A student can decide to indicate capital T, but then in a hurry writes this. So if you look at this case now, there's a discontinuity at this point. So the gamete is not fully cycled. If the gamete is not fully cycled, there's a broken egg. I have never seen a, a, a chick hatching from a broken egg. So you will be penalized for that. Then the third mark usually comes at the fusion. We'll give you one mark for accurate fusion. And this one mark will be earned, but it will also be earned with conditions. These fusion lines should never touch each other and they should not pierce through the gametes. If they pierce through the gametes, then you are also likely to attract a penalty. And the last mark comes at the genotype, the F1 genotypes. Have they been well represented? And this gives you a total of, um, of four marks there. I will, represent, I will, I will indi indicate the issue with the fusion lines again. Let us imagine that these ones are the gametes you have represented and you need to do fusion on them. Sometimes the challenge we always have is, there are sometimes when some students use rulers. So if these students use rulers, a student does this, then comes here and uses another ruler like this. A student can sometimes do this, then a student does this. So this is capital, indicates capital T, small t. Then this student gets capital T, small t. Then another student can do this, so that we have this. And in another scenario, we can have a case whereby a student also does this. So what are the issues with this kind of crossing? I want us to see. 
The issues which we always discourage that you must be very keen to avoid is this. One, this fusion line is not touching the gamete. So this is a common mistake, number one. Another time, another case, this student who is using the ruler is not careful enough to ensure that these fusion lines are joined together. This is mistake number two, which is also very common. And the mistake number three is a case where a student has fusion lines which are penetrating through the gametes. This is another very common mistake number three that must always be avoided uh, anytime you are dealing with uh, the crossings. But then we also have another very common scenario where a student can decide to do this. You can find this scenario here where a student does this. This one comes here. The student indicates capital T, small t. And then the student does this. So if you look at this, we have a problem. And the problem we have here is these lines are have fusing before they touch the gamete. And they are not even touching the gamete. So this is a case where fusion, where a mark will be lost um, needlessly. So it's always important for us to take note of that one. The fusion lines must not touch the gamete before, must not touch before they meet the gametes. Let us always avoid that mistake. And then the choice of letters, remember, usually differs with the kind of inheritance pattern. By now you need to remember that we always have three common inheritance patterns that we always learn. We have complete dominance, we have incomplete dominance, and we have codominance. And we always have very, very serious uh, issues when it comes to students distinguishing these inheritance patterns. Let us try to imagine a scenario. If at all you cross a pure breed red flowered plant and a pure breed white flowered plant, and you find that all the offspring, high, all the offspring they produce white flowered plants. This will indicate that the gene for white flower is totally dominant over the gene for red flower, and therefore there is a case of complete dominance. But we always have main issues with these other two, where sometimes in some literature they are being treated as if they are referring to the same thing while they are not. Sometimes if you cross a red flowered plant and a white flowered plant, you end up finding that in the F1 offspring, all the plants produce flowers with a pink flower. And a pink flower is a flower that is intermediate. It's like a blend of the two parental colors. So this is a case of incomplete dominance. But when it comes to codominance, which is represented in this final case here on the far right, if you cross a red flowered plant and a white flowered plant, and you find that the offspring plant, it, it, you, you are able to observe the flowers having white patches, and red patches, then that one is a case of codominance. So what is the difference between codominance and incomplete dominance? In incomplete dominance, the parental alleles or the parental genes, they interact in a way that gives an intermediate color of the parental traits. It's like the, the, the alleles interact in a way that gives us an offspring with a color that is like a blend of the parental traits. So you can see like in the case of the incomplete dominance, there is a third phenotype, a third phenotype being introduced here. The other phenotypes, are we are in the parental generation, we are having two, two phenotypes, white flowered, red flowered. But now in the, in the F1 offspring, we are having a third phenotype being introduced in this case. That is a case of incomplete dominance. But in the case of codominance, there is no third phenotype. The phenotypes which we, the phenotype we are observing here is that we are observing red patches which are found in the parental generation. We are observing white patches which are found in the parental generation once again. So this is a case of complete dominance. Complete dominance simply refers to an inheritance pattern in which the parental alleles are both expressed in the hybrid phenotype. And it's a common mistake where some students like mentioning that codominance is a form of inheritance where the two parental alleles are equally expressed. It is not about equally expressed. It's about the two parental alleles being expressed in the phenotype of the hybrid um, organism in the F1 generation. And we can also ask you, 
to give us examples of traits which show codominance in, 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 in humans, uh, which are of course sickle cell trait and uh, the AB blood groups. Remember blood groups, the AB blood groups is uh, a classical case of multiple allelism, a car uh, where inheritance of uh, a character is being controlled by more than two alleles. All the cases of Mendel, that Mendel described, characteristics were being controlled by two alleles, but in the case of um, the ABO blood group system, the ABO blood group system is being controlled by three alleles. So that is a case of multiple allelism, and uh, allele A and allele B, they are codominant to each other. If an organism is to have genotype AB for blood groups, then the red blood, uh, the red blood cell surface of this individual will have antigen A and will have antigen B. And also we have the case of sickle cell trait. If an individual is heterozygous for this condition, remember some of the red blood cells will be normal, uh, normally, normally shaped, but some others will be having the sickle uh, shape. We also observe um, codominance in animals. Like if you cross a, pure, uh, cross a red bull and a white cow, you get an, um, an offspring with red and white patches. And remember, it's not about being equally expressed. It's about both the two parental phenotypes expressing themselves in the phenotype of the F1 offspring. So let us take note of this. We should be able to clearly distinguish between uh, incomplete dominance and um, incomplete dominance and codominance. Then we also have the case of the Punnett square which we need to be able to learn how to, how to use the case of the Punnett square. Students usually find this very easy to use, but the truth is it appears easy, but they make so many mistakes that are important for us to highlight. When you're using a Punnett square, we also have common things to take note of. Like you see uh, the way this is done, this is very perfectly done. This is a Punnett square that has been perfectly done. But I want us to look at this Punnett square closely again, the, 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 the one that is following. And also remember, if you are told, if you decide to use a Punnett square, remember the preliminary stages remain the same. First of all, you have to show the parental phenotypes. Then you come to parental genotypes. And so, assuming this is tall, and this is uh, dwarf, and then this is capital T, and then this is TT, then this is done. You have to indicate the cross. And then that is when you now come to the Punnett square. You draw your square there. So if you just come to the Punnett square without indicating the preliminary, we have a problem with you. And you don't have to indicate the gametes before coming to the Punnett square. That is always important to take note of there. And remember, your genetic cross will be null and void if you omit the cross. If you omit the cross, then your genetic cross. So that is the normal genetic cross of this one. It will be null and void. Let us take note of that. Now, um, it is important to note that Exams are not anyone's joy. You can be very well prepared, but the truth is, if any time you're going to do an exam and the exams do not scare you, then you're not prepared enough. It's normal sometimes to get an exam and you find you are confused. You're like, where did the teacher say that to indicate the, the cross? Must the cross be at the genotype or at the phenotype? If you put the cross at the phenotype and you don't put it at the genotype, we will penalize you. If you put it at the genotype, you win. So, but you are confused now. You are like, the teacher said we put it at the genotype or the phenotype. At that point in time, you can do a gamble. The best thing you can do, put your cross at the phenotype there, put another cross at the genotype there. In that way, you will be shielded because you shall have placed one of the crosses at the appropriate place to earn your marks. Now, this is a Punnett square that is having problems. Remember when we're looking at uh, the genetic cross, we said the gametes must be fully cycled, no discontinuity. But if you look at our Punnett square, at this particular point we realize we have uh, problems, like there are discontinuities in this Punnett square. 
if you are keen enough and reflect, you will realize this point is not complete in that uh, planet square. This is also not complete. This is also not complete. You must ensure that your squares are fully continuous, no discontinuity. And there's another serious problem if you are keen there. Remember, we always uh, split this box from top left to bottom right. But if you see the way that is done, it is running this way. And we are seeing this one, and we are seeing this represented here. The way it is, these gametes here is like both of them are coming from the male. And this one, both of them are also coming from the male. So this is like a planet square that is representing a hermaphrodite. It's like both the gametes are coming from, from one organism, from the male. So usually take note that it runs, the planet square runs the way this one is represented. If I can bring you back on this one that we were having before. So if we have this, I'm just representing the first uh, square there. The first square, we need to split it this way. So that when you represent this one here, these gametes are coming from the male. And now when you have this one here, these gametes are coming from the female. But if it is indicated the other way around, if you do this, then we have a problem with your planet square. If this is what you do, then we are having a serious problem with you. If you decide to do this like this, then it will mean all these gametes are coming from this, which is an inaccurate representation of the same. Let us take serious note of that as we move forward. So remember, I usually do the different patterns of inheritance, complete dominance and incomplete and complete dominance. If it is a case of complete dominance, remember, we use a capital letter to represent the dominant gene and a small letter to represent the recessive gene. But if it's a case of incomplete dominance or codominance, then we always represent the alleles with different capital letters. Different capital letters. Always take note of that. But there's something very critical I wish to mention here, that you must always use the letters given to you by neck. Do not try to use your own letters. However much you try to, you, 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 you have your favorite letters, never use other letters. You must always use the letters given to you, by, directed by the question. But this is where you will be caught. Because if you are keen, you are likely to commit a very serious mistake. I want us to imagine that in garden pea plants, the seed coat, seed coat can be wrinkled, or it can be smooth. And then you are told that the allele for smooth seed coat is dominant over the allele for wrinkled seed coat, meaning this is dominant and this is um, recessive. So if we represent the allele for smooth seed coat with the capital S, we will represent the allele for wrinkled seed coat with a small s. But these letters can be very tricky. So let us assume that you are told to cross a smooth seed coat plant which is heterozygous and a wrinkled, a wrinkled seed coat. So this means in the crossing, I'm not going to go through the uh, illustrations. I just want to drive a point home. Remember the allele, the genotype for the smooth seed coat, which is heterozygous, will be capital S, small s. But for the wrinkled seed coat will be small s, small s. And then we have the cross in between. Why do we always have a problem here? Remember. 
for most letters, we always represent capital letters and small letters differently. For example, if it is capital A, this is capital A, and this is small a. If it is capital B, it is this, and this is small b. But the problem we always have here is that a student can begin this so well, and then when you come to the gametes now, the student decides to represent capital S there. The student forgets and now does this. And when this is done, where is the problem going to be? The capital S and the small s, they are written the same way. The only difference is always on the size. But sometimes the student gets lost in the process. And now when we look at the letters we have used to represent the gametes, we now cannot see the small, uh, the small uh, letter and the capital letter. So this student starts to lose marks from gametes going down. And this one can be avoided. So there's need to always be very keen when handling this. We always insti insist you use the letters given to you by neck. But even in using those letters, be aware of what I describe as the neck letter trap. And this can be the same with the letters like S. They will give you letters uh, C. They will give you letter M. And these letters, the capital letter and the small letter, they are written the same way. So the only way you get to distinguish between the capital, the dominant gene, and the recessive gene is by ensuring that there is a clear distinction on the size. Like this is a, uh, it's a screenshot that I want you to have a look at. This was in KCSE and many students lost marks because of this. In beans, the gene for purple color is dominant over the gene for white color. A pure breeding bean pea plant with the purple f color was crossed with the heterozygous bean plant. Now this student does so well to indicate the other side you are having homozygous dominant for purple color. This side you are having capital P, small p. But let's look at the gametes level now. If we come down to the gametes level now, you find that between the two letters, you cannot tell which one is a small letter. This is a student who has been lost by, who is lost by the, the uh, by the letters. So it's always this always need for you to be very very keen when dealing with the letters that has been presented to you, for use. But it's always very very important to ensure that you only use the letters given to you by by neck. Do not use your own letters. Then we have the aspect of phenotypic and genotypic ratios. Very common questions we like asking. You are given a scenario to, calcul to, to work out. Then we ask you to represent the genotypic and phenotypic ratios. And the common problems you experience here is students giving ratios which are unsimplified. For example, a student can give a ratio like this one as their final answer. Or a student decides to give you a ratio of this. Or a student presents his or her answer as one to one. Or a student can now decide to do this. So which student is correct here? This student is wrong because the ratio here is unsimplified. This student is wrong and the student is wrong is the reason why the student is wrong is because we are not seeing the numerical aspect of the ratios. This student is also wrong because we are not seeing the alpha aspect of the ratio but this student is correct. That's why I'm, we say that the ratio must always be alphanumerical. We want to see the numbers and we want to see the letters representing the various genotypes. If it were phenotypic ratios, the same thing. If you come and you find three purple to one white, it must be represented like this. You don't come and you say the ratio is three to one. We are not seeing the phenotypes attached to this three to one. And therefore this one will not score and this is what scores. So the ratios must always be alpha numerical. These ones are critical issues that as candidates, you must always observe and ensure you have a solid understanding of. Then we have another serious challenge when it comes to the sex-linked traits. Linked traits, remember, are traits, traits which are found on the same chromosome and are always inherited together. It's important for you to note that we have close to 20,000 genes in humans. 
But of these 20,000 genes, how many chromosomes do we have? We only have 46. So this means one chromosome can contain so many genes. So the genes which are located on the same chromosome and are always transmitted together are the ones we are referring to as the linked, linked genes. But the traits controlled by the genes which are linked on the same chromosomes, we call them the linked traits. And common linked traits which we like to ask you questions on are hemophilia, color blindness, which are linked to X. And also we have hairy pinna and premature baldness, which are linked to Y. But uh, you can see I have highlighted the two traits on Y, hairy pinna and premature baldness. I have highlighted them in red. I have highlighted them in red because for a long time these traits have been treated as traits linked to Y chromosome, while the truth is they are not linked to Y chromosome. We can even have some premature baldness which is being inherited from mothers and not fathers as previously thought so. Even hairy pinna is not really much of a Y-linked trait, but because uh, our book still dictates, so if they ask you for the Y-linked traits, then that those are the Y traits being perceived as Y-linked at this particular time in our course books. So if you are asked questions on, 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 on the X-linked traits, the genes must be indicated on the sex chromosomes. But we always have a, a, a problem where sometimes the, 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 the trait is an X-linked trait, but we find students indicating the gene even on the, on the Y chromosome, and that is a very serious mistake. Maybe I want us to take a, an example on Y linkage, and we cross one, then we see. Let's look at this. Colorblindness is due to a recessive gene lo C located on the X chromosome. A normal man for color vision marries a colorblind woman. So we have to show the genotypes of their children, and then we work out the probability of them getting a colorblind child, their son being colorblind, them getting a son, and the son being colorblind. This will be important for us to also look at the aspects of calculation, so probabilities, which are very, very essential to us. So how do we work out this one? Remember, for vision, we have two possibilities. One can have normal color vision, and one can have, can be color blind. So we are told color blindness is due to a recessive gene C. So it means the gene for normal color vision is dominant and therefore we will represent it with the capital C. But we are told that a normal man for color vision marries a color blind woman. So to work out this one, we start from parental genotypes. Why am I not starting from parental phenotypes? Color blindness is not something that manifests itself physically, so that I'm able to look at someone and I just see this person is someone who is color blind, just like hemophilia. Now, a normal man, so this man is normal. Remember the genotype for man is XY, but the gene for color blindness is located on the X chromosome. So if the man is normal, meaning the man must be having the gene for normal color vision. Our challenge usually with candidates is candidates indicate still going, coming ahead to, to indicate a gene on the Y chromosome. Yet the question is very clear that the gene is located on the X chromosome only. So we cross this one with our woman who, whom we are told is color blind. So if the woman is color blind, it means this woman must be having two copies of the recessive gene for color blindness. If we come to the gametes now, this is capital C there, this is Y, this is what we have, and this is what we have. So if we now work out the crossing, the fusion, this comes with this, so this is X capital C, XC. If we bring this one to this, this is X capital C, X small c. If we bring this one to this, that possible fusion, that is what we have, and also this one here, we end up having X small c and Y. So this is our F1 genotypes. Who are these people? Who are these people in terms of color vision? 
This is a normal vision daughter. This one is also a normal vision daughter. But if you look at the sons, this is colorblind, this is colorblind. So all the sons are colorblind. Colorblind sons. Remember, we said before, there must be a cross there for you to earn a mark here. The gametes, when you are representing them, they must be fully cycled and you must have used the appropriate letters, another mark. The fusions, you must do them correctly, another mark. Then the final mark comes on the F1 genotypes, if you have represented them correctly. Now, looking at this scenario, let's come to those questions now. What is the probability of the, them getting a colorblind child? Probability is always a measure of occurrence of chance. We try to measure the possibility of an event occurring. And uh, it is easy for you to imagine that maybe if this family was to have four children, then maybe the two daughters, all of them will be normal, and then the two sons, all of them will be colorblind. But th these are usually very random events that, uh, events that occur. But we can always try to make calculations that we are able to at least approximate with some degree of... Um, we can always try to estimate the chances of an event occurring. So what is the probability of them getting a colorblind child? That probability is going to be given by probability, probability of color blind child over all children. So when we come here now, we look at these children. How many children are we having? We're having four. One, two, three, four. And how many are colorblind? We have two. And how many children do we have in total? We are having four children. So this will be two over four, which simplifies to a half. You can express probability in terms of a fraction, in terms of decimals, or in terms of percentage. That will be 50%. If we come to the probability of them getting uh, their son being colorblind, probability of their son, calling their son being colorblind that will be probability color blind sun over all suns. So how many suns do we have who are color blind according to this working? We are having two suns being color blind. So that will be two over. How many suns are we having? We are having two suns. So that is two over two, giving you a probability of one. What this means basically is that in this family, if they were to give birth to a son, then without question that son will be colorblind. But then let's look at that interesting case. What is the probability of them getting a son and the son being colorblind? That question is having two events we have to think about. We have to look at the probability of, first of all, this family, what is their probability of getting a son? And then what is their probability, the probability of that son being colorblind? So, disregarding the gene for colorblindness and normal vision, ideally every crossing will usually give you two daughters and two sons. So the probability of getting a son or a daughter is always a half or 50%. So that third question has got two probabilities. It is going to be probability of a son and probability of son being colorblind. So probability of a, of a son or a daughter in any union is always a half. And usually with the loss of probability, where and that is times. And the probability of the son being colorblind, we have determined that one up here already as one. So that would be a half times one to give you a half. So that will be there. That's how we always work out the probabilities. The probability is always given by the number of possi uh, possible outcomes of that event you are asked over the total possible events we are talking about. So it's always important for us to look into this. So 
we will continue from there. There are still issues we need to talk about, but we'll continue from there in our next session. Thank you so much for your time and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much, Mweshimiwa. Let's do this some other time. Thank you very much, comrades and students. I hope you've really enjoyed the lesson which has been offered by Mr. Richard Nesta. That is on biology uh, genetics. Now you know uh, the formation of a boy or a girl. And <laughs> some people on the in the streets here do say that if you want to probably get a boy or a girl, then uh, you need to know the specific days. That, that is yet to be established scientifically <laughs> by the scientists, although we cannot really bank on it so much. So, Nesta, you've really dispensed knowledge like uh, you don't care. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it and thank you. God bless you so much. That is a, a comrade whose intellectual capacity is at optimum. Asante sana. Tibim.